All right, well, uh, I guess we might as well get started. There's about 20 of us here now. Uh, my name is John Thompson. I'm an international representative with the United Electrical Radio Machine Workers of America, or UE. Uh, I also serve on the steering committee for the labor campaign for single payer. Uh, I've seen uh, a couple of my fellow UE members here, Carl Rosen, the president, national president of our unions here. I think George Wax Monksky, our president of our UE Eastern region is also here. So we have a good turnout for our membership, at least for my workshop. So uh, to get started, uh, just some basic information. Uh, the fight to win Medicare for all will not be won unless we bring the power that we collectively possess as workers into this campaign. We will not win Medicare for all strictly through lobbying our members of Congress, although this is important work that we must continue to engage in. The healthcare industrial complex comprises nearly 20% of the US GDP. They're a powerful foe that can easily outspend us and has done so over the years. This is why even though a majority of the US public supports Medicare for all, we still don't have it even in the midst of a deadly pandemic that has claimed the lives of nearly 1 million of our fellow citizens. We have to bring the fight for Medicare for all into our workplaces. We have to put pressure on our employers to join us in this fight, even though we know that ideologically they are aligned more with the healthcare industrial complex. They need to feel the heat from their workers that they are not some neutral party that doesn't have a stake in this fight or that thinks that they can just continue to, to push more of the rising costs for healthcare benefits onto their workers. We know that in union workplaces with a contract, negotiating healthcare benefits is one of the most difficult items in contract negotiations. In workplaces without a contract, healthcare costs are a backdoor way for the bosses just to push the costs onto workers' paychecks. We know that if workers get laid off or go on strike, they lose their healthcare benefits. We saw this during the pandemic when millions of workers lost their employer provided healthcare benefits. This is why we need to get healthcare benefits off the table. By bringing the fight for Medicare for all into your contract negotiations, you're not only fighting for your members, you're fighting for the entire working class or what some call bargaining for the common good. In this workshop, we'll discuss how you can bring the fight for Medicare into your workplace, whether you're in a union or not. So uh, for this workshop, we're gonna try to make it as much interactive as possible. Uh, please make sure you know where the reaction buttons are so that you can participate in this workshop today. Uh, so let's test this out. Give me a thumbs up if you want Medicare for all. The reaction buttons are at the bottom of your screen. You see that little reaction? You can go on there. There's different little icons that you can push, but it looks like most of you are getting that. Okay, so before we get started, I, I don't wanna take anything for granted in this workshop. Uh, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Can I have a volunteer explain what Medicare for All is? Uh, you can volunteer in the chat, or if I can see you, raise your hand. Any volunteers explain what Medicare for all is? I know there's enough people on this call who can easily explain it. George, I'm gonna call you out. <laughs> Thanks a lot, brother. <laughs> well, so what is Medicare for all? Simplified, George. Simplified, it's, it's healthcare for everyone. Uh, that uh, anybody, any citizen in this country ought to be covered by health care. We ought to get rid of the uh, uh, health care in insurance companies and uh, uh, bring that in, you know, under our own control and get rid of the for-profit uh, part of the health, health insurance industry. Mm -hmm. So basically, it would cover everything, all your health care needs. And there wouldn't be any co-pays, deductibles, or premiums. Right. Uh, cur currently, our Medicare for All bill is 1976. It has 120 co-sponsors in the House. And uh, Senator Bernie Sanders will be introducing his Senate version here shortly in the Senate. 
So let's think about some specific struggles we have faced with our workplace-based health insurance. If you can, give me a thumbs up if your answer is yes to any of these questions. Has your employer tried to pass on increased health insurance costs to workers? Have premiums gone up? Have copays gone up? Have workers taken pay freezes or cuts to preserve benefits? Has your employer made health insurance so costly or so worthless that large numbers of employees don't take it? Has anybody's employer provided health insurance uh, forced uh, the uh, employees to pay a surcharge if they have a working spouse who elects to be on your health insurance? Would any, anyone be willing to share an example of what happened in their workplace? Uh, just a brief example. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, just you know, raise your hand or put your name in the chat. Any specific examples of how uh, your employer provided health care has gotten worse? Anyone? I mean, everybody was raising. OK, Dixon, you want to talk about it? Sure. Um, this is an example from a while ago. My current employer, uh, Physicians for a National Health Program, is, is pretty good on the health insurance front. Um, but years ago, before the ACA, uh, I was working for a small trade magazine, and uh, my boss told me um, that, hey, I'm going to pick up the uh, premiums for your individual health insurance policy. They didn't have a group policy, but he said, you know, as part of your compensation, I'll pay your premiums. Um, and I was in my early 20s at the time. Um, I was getting insurance for like as cheap as anybody would be getting it um, on the so-called individual market back then. And, um, you know, so I got my uh, invoice, uh, gave it to him and he said, basically, oh, well, that's too much. I'm not paying that. And um, so that's, <laughs> that was, and that was the end of that conversation. So I could leave the job or I could, uh, or I could like it. Uh, just to respond to Martha, no, PNHP has does have good insurance. <laughs> so this is an example from a while ago. No, I was kidding around, Dixon. I'm a longtime <laughs> PNHP member. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're glad to hear that now. Yeah, no, they, they do. There, did, you, did you have your hand up? Did you want to talk about your employer-based health insurance? Uh, sure. So I'm here with Actors Equity Association, and we're complicated because we're kind of like the construction industry that we have multiple employers. So to qualify for our health insurance, we have to work a number of weeks through the year. And because of the pandemic and nobody really working in the theatrical industry, um, the pension and health had to raise our ability to qualify for several more weeks. And now we only get six months of coverage at a time. So that greatly impacts people that might be, um, you know, pregnant expecting because then you only have health care for six months. Um, it's much harder to get and it's much more expensive. So everything is kind of stinky right now. Yeah, you got to hope that you don't get sick when that six months is <laughs> you're not covered. Uh, Kim, did you have your hand up to talk about I your? Did. Can you? Yeah, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I do, I'm a nurse, but right now, um, since the pandemic, I've um, left the emergency room setting and have been working as a care manager. So my job is to really work with the insurance companies. And I can just tell you, firsthand experience, just because you have insurance doesn't mean your services that you need in healthcare is actually going to be covered. Uh, people don't know that until they have an a actual hospitalization, and I work in the rehab department, so often people with traumatic injuries will come to a rehab department, stay for the limited time that they have there, and they may have to go to like a subacute rehab or go to like a nursing facility to get better, and you would be so surprised how that is limited by your insurance, and in fact, some people don't even have that with their insurance plan, so um, even in having insurance is not a guarantee that your medical bills will be covered by the insurance. People don't know that, so. Yeah. Well, thanks for all those good examples of 
why this employment-based health insurance is problematic, to put it mildly. So uh, do you think bringing the fight for Medicare for all into your workplace is a good strategy? If so, why? Right, that's the, that's the whole purpose of what we're thinking about here is, should we bring this fight into our workplace? You know, most of the time we're talking about lobbying uh, members of Congress to get them on board of it, but actually bringing that fight into our workplace. Do you think this is a good strategy? Mark, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, this might be a secondary reason, but um, I mean, I know both for at my workplace, I work for a union and then for the people that we represent, you know, there's a limitation to, <laughs> to how either how much we can hold the line or how good we can get our insurance in the private system. And so it, it seems to me that bringing the fight into the workplace at least helps kind of protect our, our unions from people saying like, why can't we get more? Um, so having this like alternative or a bigger club to go with our little club or something um, can be useful for people to understand the limitations at the bargaining table, however well our unions are doing uh, there in the first place. Mm -hmm. As you can see from this chart, which is several years old, the cost of premiums and the share that we have to pay have been increasing exponentially, and it's gotten worse over the last couple of years as our wages are basically flatlined. So that gap between what we're earning in wages to what we're paying in premiums is getting even further. Uh, uh, George, did you, you want to add something to that? Yeah, John, I mean, absolutely. Where else would we have these conversations? We have to have them at the workplace because that's where the people are suffering uh, from, from the health insurance industry. Uh, as Sister Kim said, uh, you know, the health insurance doesn't co cover anything. You might think you have it, but, you know, you've got co-pays, deductibles, out-of-pocket maxes, uh, and... and, and uh, the list goes on and on, and then even if you have insurance, you get a, you still get a bill. So, I mean, at the workplace is where workers again are suffering, uh, and we can have these conversations because they're telling us in the workplace that they just got this ninety five thousand dollar bill, uh, and the employers or the insurance company saying they're not going to pay it or they're going to take their good old time, and you're now going into collections because. Nobody's handling it. Um, so, you know, absolutely, this is the best place we should be talking about. It. And it, it, it involves class struggle uh, about the bigger picture of, of the power that workers have. And uh, that's, that's where these conversations need to be held. Mm -hmm. And collectively, as workers, that's our greatest source of collective power, right, is in the workplace with mm -hmm. our fellow workers, right, to take on this fight around this employment-based healthcare system. Kim, did you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to say that I think we would actually have more leverage or bargaining power if we had a single pair uh, healthcare system that we could actually take out out of the negotiating table. Every time you go to the bargaining table, what do they threaten us with? They want to take away our healthcare. So we become hostage to that, right? So if we were to actually get that off the table, I think we would have more leverage in fighting for the other issues that are really critical to, you know, um, what we want to fight for. And on top of that, I mean, you know, in 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 this country, our insurance for a lot of people is offered through the work. So your employment, you know, your insurance is contingent upon um, you being fully employed. But I know for a fact, like at a coworker several years ago in the emergency department, fellow nurse had cancer where she wasn't able to work. And at a certain point, her insurance was going to run out. And the only way that she was able to get coverage is we went around and asked other nurses if we would be willing to volunteer our hours, our holiday hours, then you know that would keep her um, as an employment status to continue on with her healthcare coverage. Other than that, she was going to at some point have to, you know, either um, 
<laughs> not get coverage or have to go on Medicaid or some other disability. And that's what's happening to a lot of people. One accident can put us out. Yeah, and that's certainly a good reason why we want to get uh, healthcare off the bargaining table. But in terms of the question of uh, bringing the fight for Medicare into our workplace as a strategy, uh, Terry, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I think also the uh, an advantage of bringing it into the workplace is that for those of us who work in at small businesses, small and medium sized businesses, as well as in nonprofits or municipalities, it's actually in the interest of the employer as well for us to get away from this. I mean, for example, in Sacramento, the teachers are in struggles with the, the school district um, because the school district is requiring them to switch to a less expensive health plan. And the, the school district rightfully enough says, we can't afford the $35,000 per employee that your current plan um, costs us. So, uh, the, you know, municipalities, nonprofits, and small businesses would be removed from that um, that that restriction um, and that cost, and not be uh, exposed to significant other taxes to replace that. Exactly. Hey, could you give me a thumbs up or a raised hand if you've had a discussion with your coworkers or fellow union members on Medicare for All at your workplace? If you've actually talked to your coworkers about this in the workplace. Uh, can I have a volunteer, someone we haven't heard from who has tried to have this discussion at work? What was the discussion like? Uh, let's see, who haven't we seen here? Uh, well. Let's start with uh, Mark again. How'd that conversation go, Mark? You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, like I said, I work for a union um, and um, I, there, we have good private health insurance benefits. Um, and so I think the skepticism or the resistance has been people who have spent a lot of time bargaining those um, those good insurance benefits um, uh, being reluctant to to give them up um, and and, and uh, you know at best not not thinking that a a Medicare for all system would be better for everyone or at worst, um, not practicing the solidarity that we try to teach our members all the time. Um, so how, how do you overcome something like that, that, you know, we spent all this resources, all this energy to win these healthcare benefits uh, that are okay, right? Let's face it, they're not as good as Medicare for all will be and uh, probably cost a lot more of the workers paycheck. But how do you how do you overcome somebody when they raise that kind of uh, argument that you know why risk what we have when we fought so hard to get it? Um, the the main thing that I've talked about is is the um, is what it would mean for the work that we do with our members at the local bargaining table. You know, if we had a, a single payer system that so much more time can be spent on working conditions for teachers and bus drivers than on protecting the, the health insurance that they have. Um, and it's usually couched in terms of like our insurance is better than what other people have. So it's just, um, it feels like kind of a low consciousness on um, that the lowering tide has sunk all boats rather than a rising tide lifting all of those boats. Anybody else want to share how, uh, if you've had a conversation with your coworkers at your workplace on Medicare for All? Sarah? Yeah, I think ours is a little bit complicated because we already have public policy that we support federal universal health care. So we already support our, our national union does. But we have members that want to go for it state by state. 
and there are states that are red that will never go for it. So then our union, our national union, will end up being divided. And because there is a, a bill in New York, and that's where the majority of our membership lives, that would basically allow that to be implemented for only the New Yorkers, and then it would further divide our union. So our workplace conversation about Medicare for All is to make sure it's a federal strategy as opposed to state and local. So that's been a very um, trying conversation. So we're all talking about it, but it's a matter of making sure our strategy is in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, McKee, I... go ahead. Hi. Um, I brought it up a few years ago at a union meeting. And um, of course, I live in South Carolina. I'm from New York, and there's a good percentage of people in South Carolina that do not have health insurance. So I would say the majority of our members understand that they are very lucky to have insurance, although once a year we take a pay cut um, because of health insurance. And they kind of bought into it because they have family members that don't have insurance. And most of them realize that it's not all about them. There are a few that didn't care and are gonna hold on to whatever they have. But a lot of the members realize they have family members that are suffering and would like to see a change. Martha, do you wanna add something? Yeah, I do. I wanna take on the sister from Actors, Actors Equity, Sarah, um, in this way. I'm in New York. Uh, I work very hard to get the New York Health Act passed, I also work very hard to pass federal Medicare for all. This is not an either or, this is a tactical question. That is to say, if we could get it passed in New York, that would be awesome for the people of New York and it would lead the way for the rest of the country. If we can get it passed federally, that's better than any state by state, uh, um, campaign for sure, hands down, no question. Uh, it happens that I did some of my graduate work approximately a hundred years ago in the province of Saskatchewan. And everybody's like, oh, where's that? Well, that's the province that first had Medicare in Canada uh, as of 1962. And as a result of their great work, the whole of Canada had health care by 1971. So this isn't either or, this isn't you people doing state by state are somehow opposed to a national strategy, not even slightly, um, but this really is a question of tactics. And I would say it's a both and. All right, so has anyone raised Medicare for all during your con union's contract negotiations if you participated in the contract negotiations and brought it up in, in contract negotiations in any capacity? Has anyone, if you could give me a show of hand, um, that you actually brought this up right across the table from your employer, anyone? Mickey, do you have your hand up or are you saying that you do? You brought this up in the contract negotiations? You're, you're on mute, mute McKee. No, I'm sorry. Um, I don't participate in the contract negotiations, but as I said, we used to have the, I work um, under construction and we used to have all of our health insurance paid by the contractor. And about eight or nine years ago during negotiations, um, the people that were negotiating gave up part of the increases. So now, as I said, each year we take a pay decrease every January 1st, because we now share in the cost of the health insurance, which we never did before. Mark Dudzik, I see you have your hand raised. Oh, yeah. So a couple of experiences from, uh, you know, I haven't been at the bargaining table in a lot of years, but uh, in the early 2000s, um, we, in my local union, we raised it um, with, we had a group of uh, sewage treatment plants in New Jersey um, and the New Jersey health plan was going through the ceiling and they were looking for concessions. And we tried to get those, uh, those uh, public authorities to go on record as uh, joining the union to, to pursue a, 
uh, Medicare for all, a single payer solution to the healthcare crisis. Uh, we weren't successful, um, but you know, we kind of used it as a mobilizing tool, got people to show up at the board meetings and kind of push back on them on the, the line that the only way to, to do anything was to keep cutting uh, benefits. Uh, and then the, you know, the other thing was in the 2007 national oil bargaining, we actually got the um, oil refiners in the US uh, to sign on to a, a memorandum of understanding that said that the union and the company would mutually explore uh, solutions to the healthcare crisis um, and work on common, common solutions and advocate uh, together to solve this crisis. Um, and there was a procedure set up where we'd sit down and listen to experts talk about the crisis and stuff. Um, and, you know, we thought we'd get our, you know, we could perhaps win, you know, some of these multinationals who do business in countries that have single payer systems. Uh, we might be able to win somebody like BP or Royal Dutch Shell into uh, publicly supporting Medicare for all, but it was a, it's a complete debacle. Uh, they refused to listen to uh, PNHP credentialed experts on healthcare. And, uh, you know, they really only wanted to talk about cost shifting onto the back of the workers. So it didn't last out that one contract. Yeah. All right. Uh, my national union, uh, UE, has been advocating for Medicare for all type health insurance plan for decades now. Most workers tend to like the flexibility and ease of the idea as a concept, but the main stumbling blocks we run into is always the money, right? How are we gonna pay for it? Workers assume that this plan will cost too much and they specifically assume it will cost them more money. We decided we needed a tool for take, talking about this idea with our members so that they can see how much money they would save under a different kind of health plan. That's why we developed a healthcare cost calculator tool to use with our members. It uses a worker's current income and healthcare costs like premiums and co-pays to compare how much they currently spend on their healthcare to what they're likely to spend under a single payer program. And I'm gonna show you right now, share with you uh, what this looks like. And it's my understanding that um, Let me see if I can find it here on my, I had it up earlier. Can you see the healthcare cost calculator now? No? We just see the, the the file name, we don't see the actual calculator. Let me, let me try it again. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, this is a fillable uh, form that you can actually download and type in your answers. Uh, and from my understanding uh, that this, uh, tool is going to be available to anybody who signed up for this workshop. Uh, if you don't get it that way, um, you could always uh, email me and I'll share some things in, in the chat at the end. So uh, what we need for folks to do is type in their salary from the previous year, right? So this is say 2021. Uh, then for the premium, uh, we add in how much per paycheck uh, for your medical benefits, your dental insurance, health, or your uh, vision, whatever, times how many paychecks per year, that'll give you that. And then you add in the various deductibles, and then it all calculates itself. You don't have to do any of the math. You just punch in the numbers. And I'll show you what that will look like uh, in an actual completed one.
All right, can you see it now? Hands up if you can see the uh, one that I filled out. We good? Yes, good. Okay, so these are some numbers I just averaged out based on some research of an annual salary of a union worker uh, in 2021. They made about 60,000 some dollars. Uh, their premiums added up to $230 per check. They had 26 checks that came to almost $6,000. Their upfront deductible from the previous year that they paid was $2,000. You can see I added in co-pays for uh, primary care, specialist care, uh, uh, drugs that they had to prescribe, uh, vision, dental costs. This was for a family care plan. Uh, uh, and that total out-of-pocket costs came to about $3,600. So the total deductions uh, for their healthcare costs for the previous year came to $9,574. The percentage of their salary then that went towards paying for their healthcare costs, and a lot of people get lost in this, that they think that premium is the only thing that they are paying each year. No, it's everything else that's added into it. So the calculator will calculate that out. So this particular worker is seeing almost 16% of their salary going towards their health insurance, healthcare costs in the previous year. So that's a substantial amount of your salary. Now, I know that uh, Bernie Sanders has said that under his plans that a worker uh, would only pay 4% of their uh, salary uh, above $29,000. So your first $29,000 you wouldn't pay on, then anything above that is 4%. So you could see what the difference would be. It would be a huge savings, right? And uh, so this tool actually is a good tool to use prior to you going into negotiations, right? And uh, I'm using this in uh, uh, some upcoming contract negotiations with uh, GE Appliances for our factory services. I'm gonna have our members fill this out. Then they can see concretely how much of their salary is going to pay for healthcare. And you know, for this uh, last example, it was almost 16%. Now you can make a concrete argument with that person then, right? That, hey, Medicare for all, which would cover everything, all of your healthcare needs with no premiums, no co-pays, no deductibles, free at the point of service, and you would be paying 4% of your salary for that plan. And uh, I've seen some studies that they said that the average worker would realize an additional $10,000 in potential wages and benefits as a result of going to a Medicare for all system. Does anybody have any questions about this healthcare cost calculator? Martha. Um, less a question than a comment. And that is that just so people know, you know how we talk about under insurance? Um, the definition of being underinsured is that you spend 10% or more out of pocket on healthcare costs. So that calculator that you showed us is uh, is one of your members who is considered uninsured, uh, underinsured in our right. current system. I also just want to caution people, this is likely not going to happen in your shop, but it could. Um, that every now and again, when we focus on just, you're gonna save money as our primary, I, it's not a thing that I like to super focus on. Yes, with union members, but not always in the talks that I give. You know, the talks that I give are more maybe about security and about morality um, than just, we're gonna save money. Um, and the reason that I say this is that I went to give a talk about the New York Health Act with another brother who was, you know, we, we do this work together. And we happened to be giving a talk on the Gold Coast of Long Island in a very affluent community. And these were people who were really in favor of the New York Health Act. 
And he started handing out a calculator and they were like, oh, I'm going to pay more because if, if you make more than $400,000 a year as a family, you're going to pay a little more in the New York Health Act. And we were like standing in a room full of rich people. So it kind of slightly backfired on us. Not, But anyway, my point was simply, it's not the whole focus. It's a great focus with your union sisters and brothers, the way that you demonstrated. Right, it, it shows concretely how much they're paying out of pocket for their health care. Um, and it it's, and uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have been involved with actual contract negotiations. Usually before you go into contract negotiations, you do an information request and you request information about the health care, right? And they give you all this data about health care, what, what different people are enrolled in. But this tool that I just showed, this healthcare cost calculator, makes it personal, right? So I use that with my members so that they can calculate themselves how much they're used, how much they're, this premium, how much is deductibles, co-pays are costing them. And then you could put that across the table to the employer, right? Hey, look, this is what your great healthcare costs uh, that you offer us is actually costing our members, you know, and 15, 16%, actually, we've had members who pay more than 20% of their salary towards their healthcare costs. So it's a good tool to use with your members in educating them about the actual cost of this healthcare, but also to push back on your employer across the table when they're crying about, oh, our our healthcare costs are going up. We we have to push more onto 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 your members to pay for this. Uh, so I would encourage folks to start using that tool, and uh, you know to educate your members and to you know use it during contract negotiations to push back on your employer. So I'm just curious, John. I have a question because we're about to go into negotiations. I'm not sitting at the table. I, I'm in a very big union and I'm, a, anyway, um, I'm not following. I understand about pushing back on increases, which we get every single contract. Um, but how do you use the fight for Medicare for all in bargaining? Because after all, your employer, all your employer can do is say, great idea, wish we had it. How are you using it as a bargaining chip? That's what I'm not following. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna get into that uh, here now. You know, I've used this, uh, brought this up in contract negotiations now uh, with several employers. I intend to do it with several more this year. It's a permissive subject of bargaining, right? So how do I bring it up in, in contract negotiations? Let me uh, share a couple of examples of how we do it how I've done it. And uh, I apologize if I have to go back into my documents to retrieve this, but I thought I had pulled this out earlier, but okay. Can you see this? This sample letter for employers supporting single payer Medicare for all health insurance? Yep. Okay, good. So this is another tool that we use and encourage our members to use in negotiations, right? So your employer is whining about, oh, look up that cost of healthcare is going up. We, we, we can't afford to absorb all this cost. We're gonna ask your members to have to absorb some more of it. Well, push across the table from them, okay? If, if this is such a concern for you, right? This is such a big thing for you, join us. Join us in coming out in support of Medicare for all. Let's get this off the table. Not only will it benefit our members who will save a hell of a lot of money, it'll also save you money. Uh, and I think that, you know, under uh, some scenarios, an employer would be paying 7% towards the cost of their employees' health insurance under a Medicare for all system. So, you know, and I know Mark had mentioned that we tried that with their uh, some of their oil employers, uh, and you know, let's 
not be mistaken here, it's a tough fight, right? They're ideologically opposed to any kind of social programs that benefit the working class, right? It's just, and some of them might even have stocks in the healthcare industrial complex that they're making a killing off of, right? So this isn't, a, this isn't gonna be an easy ask, but it's a permissive subject of bargaining. We could push it out there. We could push it, put it in their face. We can push back when they're whining. Okay, well, join us, sign on. Or you could do, you can do a joint press release, right? To put out to the press. Uh, such and such union and this employer have concluded that a Medicare for all system would be beneficial for both their employees and the employer, right? It's a permissive subject of bargaining. They reject it at first. Say, well, you know, we don't, we don't have to bargain over that. They don't, but you can continuously push it out there. And in order to really have some leverage on, on this issue of Medicare for all at the negotiating table, you have to do your homework prior to this, right? You have to educate your membership. You have to engage them. You have to use that healthcare cost calculator so they can see concretely how much they're paying more for their health care as opposed to how much they would save under Medicare for system so that they would be fully engaged in this pushback on the employer on this question and forcing them to agree. Hey, yeah, this is a great idea. We'll agree to it. I haven't had much success in this yet, but let's put it out this way. If more unions across this country would take this approach to bringing the fight for Medicare for all, into their workplace, into their contract negotiations. I think eventually over time, it would open up another avenue for in this fight for Medicare for all. Anybody have any questions, comments on that? And like I said, it's not an easy ask. It's a tough ask, you know, employers are ideologically opposed to uh, Medicare for all. It makes sense economically for them. A lot of our uh, international employers who benefit in other countries that don't have an employer-based system, for whatever reason, they're opposed to it here in the U.S. But if more unions engage at the collective bargaining table on this question and push across, right, we have uh, the United Auto Workers, I think our contract negotiations with the big three would be a good opportunity, right? All the main auto worker companies uh, have plants all around the world. Only in the US do they have to provide their employees with health insurance. And you can look at that in uh, most employers. Share similar circumstances. Questions or comments on that? How to raise this in a contract negotiations? All right, another thing that I've done um, in uh, contract negotiations, and I've had some success on this, and uh, I'm gonna share with you a contract proposal that I push across the table on Medicare for All in negotiations. And let me see if I have that here. I'm gonna have to go back into my documents, unfortunately. Can you see the sample contract proposal for Medicare for all? Yeah, okay. So like I said earlier, this uh, is a permissive subject of bargaining at this time because we don't have Medicare for all or we don't have a state-based plan. However, you could propose this in contract negotiations as a concrete way of raising Medicare for all in contract negotiations. So this is something that uh, I used in uh, some recent negotiations. If the US enacts the Medicare for All National Single Payer Health Plan, or your state enacts a single payer health care plan, the company shall provide any benefits currently provided but not included in the national or state plan. In addition, the company shall negotiate with, name of your union, and shall share any savings as a result 
of such national or state plan in the form of increased wages or additional benefits. And like I said, uh, anybody who signed up for this workshop should have access to these documents. So that's a concrete proposal uh, that I pushed across the table in all my contract negotiations now. Uh, it's a permissive subject of bargaining, right? It's not mandatory because we don't have Medicare for all, or we don't have a state-based plan, but we can certainly push it across the table. And uh, I've had success in negotiating this into contracts. Uh, at BE Appliances Factory Services, uh, which included uh, four other national unions. I had this discussion during the uh, discussion around healthcare, right? So the employer, they always put on this big PowerPoint presentation of this is what's costing us. This is what, you know, we're looking at. The best opportunity, not only to push back, but to educate uh, the employer and educate your bargaining committee members. In these negotiations, we had about 30 some members of other unions in these negotiations. So they're getting educated while you're making this argument across the table with the employer. And, you know, we had discussions among the committee, negotiating committee, about presenting this argument, about presenting this proposal. So at GE Appliances, factory services, we have actual language in a national contract along those lines that I showed you. That if in the event that it comes into being, the employer will do this, do that. Also at another uh, smaller employer that I, I have members at, we negotiated a similar uh, memorandum of agreement uh, with uh, a, a co-op called the East End Food Co-op in Pittsburgh, where they agreed that they would uh, put it in a memorandum of agreement. So it's possible to negotiate these kind of things, but like I said, you need to educate your membership on the importance of fighting for this at the negotiating table and uh, uh, to raise it in contract negotiations in a concrete way. Anybody have any questions on anything uh, that I've raised so far? Anybody think that they would be able to do this in your contract negotiations if you're actually involved in those negotiations? Raise your hand if you thought this was uh, George. How do you how do you see yourself raising this in contract negotiations, George? Well, we can make it a proposal, uh, as you said. Uh, we can educate our members about the issue and. Uh, I'm actually negotiating a contract in the next few weeks, starting one. Uh, so uh, I'll plan to raise it with my committee and uh, see where we go with it. Yeah, I would encourage you to use, use that healthcare cost calculator first so they can see concretely how much of their salary is actually going towards healthcare. And then you can explain to them, well, under Medicare for all system, 4% of your salary to, to pay for health insurance after the first $29,000, right? It's a perfect way to bring it up and contrast it. Give them, give them the calculator, let them get, get, get the shock and awe of that, and then share with them the Medicare for all alternative. Right. So uh, some other ways to bring the fight for Medicare for all into your workplace uh, in union, even if you don't have a contract, uh, prior to the annual benefits enrollment period, right? All employers have this annual enrollment time, right? Where they, this is the time for you to sign up or see if you have to make any changes to your uh, benefits. Well, use that healthcare cost calculator with your coworkers, right? That's a good time, right? They're talking about, filling out the paperwork for how much you're gonna to have to pay for their health insurance, for their dental benefits, for their vision. Pull out the healthcare cost calculator, have them do it, educate themselves on how much they're costing them. And this is a good way to uh, bring it up at that time. Uh, then uh, organize a group of workers to bring uh, a sample of this information to the boss, right? Hey, look, this is how much it's costing us for these benefits that you say are so great. Uh, 
it would be a good time to demand that the boss sign on to that letter supporting Medicare for all. Uh, you know, it's outside of contract negotiations, but this is for also for folks who don't have a union, right? I don't know if anybody in this workshop is, is without a union, but I've seen some uh, recent examples of workers organizing around, organizing around issues. I saw, uh, you know, I think it was Google uh, workers walking out over some social issue uh, several years ago. I saw in Florida at, at Disney World, uh, I'm not sure if they were union members, I think they were uh, the office workers at Disney World, uh, were upset that Disney didn't take a more proactive opposition to this anti-gay bill that was pushing itself through the legislature. So workers can, even if they're not in a union, engage in concerted activity, right? As long as there's more than one worker involved with that. So even if you don't have a union, you can still engage in concerted activity to push for a Medicare for all with your employer. Uh, if your employer has any kind of town hall type form, that's a good opportunity to raise it. Uh, I'm not sure if that goes on in, uh, in a lot of union locations, but probably in a lot of non-union locations, there's times that this can happen. Another opportunity would be at, at a membership meeting, right? If your union isn't in the forefront of fighting for Medicare for all, bring it up at a membership meeting. Uh, you can draft the Medicare for all resolution for your union, uh, either at the local level and push it up the chain to uh, your national union to adopt the Medicare for all uh, resolution and support. Any questions on any of this? Do you think this is a good approach to fighting to win Medicare for all, if a showing of hands, of, of, of a way to bringing something that is abstract to a lot of our members, right? It's a piece of legislation. Yeah, it might be great, but that's something that politicians have to agree to, right? by bringing it into the workplace, it's making it concrete for our members, right? For our coworkers to see uh, this is something that we need. Stan, you have your hand raised. You're on mute. Yeah, I, I just had my hand raised because I thought it was a good thing. Oh, okay. I don't have, really have any comments on it. <laughs> uh, Martha. Yeah, I'm just a quick question, and that is, how do we get the all the documents that you've just shared with us? Can you send those to us? Uh, well, uh, it was my understanding that the uh, uh, conference was going to make these documents available to all the participants in the workshop. But I'll chat. I'll put some links in the chat uh, where you can get get this information uh, from my union. So the issue for some of us is that we're public employees. So some of the tactics that you were talking about wouldn't exactly apply, but we're going into negotiations in the next couple of months. And I think that some of the materials that you have might be very useful. Yes. Okay. One of the issues I think we could discuss in terms of, you know, uh, at least to smaller businesses is the issue of having workers' compensation insurance. I know that a, a friend of mine who's an individual uh, contra uh, contract, he was in, in construction, and one of his burdens is having comp uh, workers' comp, and he hires you know freelance workers to work with him and so on. And it's a big um, you know financial burden for him, and he would love to hire more people, um, you know, to grow his business and. In my experience as a care manager in the hospital setting, I've had patients that are hospitalized after an accident. And you'd be surprised how workers' compensation, even though they have the insurance um, through their job, they don't want to cover their hospitalization. They said, oh, it's not work-related, you know? And I've had uh, cases where small business actually didn't have insurance and the poor guy is in the hospital after an accident. He can't get his hospitalization covered. And uh, 
you know, we have to chase down uh, private business. So if everyone had single pair, this could be also a way to eliminate uh, business costs to the um, employer. Exactly. So I put a link in the chat uh, for my union's page on Medicare for All that has a lot of uh, information as well as the healthcare cost calculator. And also I put in the chat my email address uh, if you can't, if you need uh, need these documents, uh, the, uh, the my contract proposal, or if you have additional questions or comments, Mark, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is a great project, and I think it's more important to look at this as a way to organize your members than it is to move your employers on this issue. You know, contract negotiations is the time when union members are really paying attention to what's going on. It's, it's a time when people can really debate these things and really learn a whole lot in a very short period of time. So to, to connect that up with the fight that you know you're gonna have around healthcare and, and bargaining, I think is just a really powerful tool. And I, I think the worksheet you know, works really well. We've tried that out, asked people to try it out in some different contexts. Um, and, and you know what? we're always up around where you were, John, on that, those numbers, you know, it's like, it's amazing when people sit down and think about this, it's, you know, 12, 15, 18% of their uh, income is coming out on, uh, on healthcare. So, um, you know, really wakes people up. So I think this is, you know, it's a great program and I wish more unions would begin to internalize it the way uh, the UE has. Um, you know, I have a little, I'm a little, I haven't really figured out what to do about contract language in Medicare for all. I've talked to different people about it. You know, I've always taken the position, and this gets a little wonky, but you know, union reps kind of understand it. Um, you know, that a shift to Medicare for all would trigger a duty to bargain because it's a material change in conditions. Um, and I've always wondered whether we're better off, bar you know, bargaining at that moment over the change or whether we want to pre-bargain how the spoils are going to be divided. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the best best approach is. And maybe as we get a little closer to, to victory on this, we ought to really begin to convene some smart strategic thinkers in the labor movement to kind of talk through the, the legal implications. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, we've all been burned by vague contract language. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, the other thing I've thought is maybe there ought to be some kind of an interest arbitration linked to this in case there's an impasse, you know, mid-contract, you know, if the parties can't agree, they'll submit their proposals to an arbitrator who will choose one of the two proposals or something like that. I don't know, but I've, I'd really love to talk to some really smart union negotiators about how to think through that contract language issue. Because it's going to come up, you know, uh, as we get closer to victory, this is going to be a big issue. You know, Bernie, when he campaigned, said, I'm going to figure out how, you know, we can force the bosses to give that money back to the workers. But he never really explained how he was going to do that. So, we, you know, we, uh, we really need to take that up. Exactly. And, and, and my proposal that I've been pushing you know, commits the employer to bargaining over any savings they would realize in the form of additional wages or improved benefits. And obviously, uh, you know, we need to think through uh, as we get closer to winning Medicare for all. Carl Rosen, I, I, I see you here. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on any of this? I mean, I was just chiming in on, on what Mark said. I mean, I, I think he's right. I mean, the reality is, uh, you know, we're going to have to see what's in the bill in terms of how the transition works for unionized workplaces. Uh, but, but also, it's likely that there's going to be an extended period uh, from the time the bill passes until it's fully in effect. And most, most contracts will come up during that time. So, I, I, I mean, I, I think these are good proposals. Again, I think what Mark says is, a, is the real point. This is about organizing the workers. And it's organizing the workers both to understand why they need Medicare for all and why the boss is an impediment. And I, I really think getting this idea that the boss is refusing to be part of the solution because they almost all refuse. The, the difference may be in the public sector. Some of those will come on board. You know, you might have a county board or a city council that actually pass a bill 
uh, uh, pass a, 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 a statement in, in support of Medicare for all. You know, there's a lot of good people working to get those statements passed. But other than that sort of employer, most employers are going to refuse to sign on and, you know, just out of class solidarity because they're part of, you know, they're, they're part of the, the wealthy and, and, uh, and, oppose, and they also like holding it over workers that uh, uh, you'll lose your health insurance if they fire you or if you go on strike. So for all those reasons, I'll almost certainly say no, but then it gives us a way to say, well, then stop talking about this crap at the table about you've got to pass more of the costs on us. You're refusing to be part of the solution. And to be able to have that out in front of the workers, I think is, is, uh, is really important. And, and there's nothing stopping us from taking collective action at the workplace, right? And having a rally to marching on the boss, you know, uh, those kind of tactics that we should consider as part of this fight to win Medicare for all. I remember back in the mid 90s when I worked in a plant and uh, uh, NAFTA had just passed and uh, uh, Clinton had signed it. You know, we staged a demonstration outside of my plant with a press conference. The media came and covered us, demonstrating against the passage of NAFTA. So there's a lot of creative tactics that we can use, right, to put pressure on the boss on this question of Medicare for all that we need to think about using uh, to engage our members at the workplace in this fight. The, the only other thing I'd add is uh, that healthcare cost calculator, I've actually used that in, in several different workplaces uh, where you know we've had workshops and um, the results are frequently stunning. I have only once um, come across somebody who was less than 10%. Um, and that was because it was a, somebody who was single and had no health issues. And so basically all they had is just their premiums and nothing else uh, and just for a single person. Um, everybody else was over 15%. The bulk of them, uh, I would say the average was probably into the low 20s at least. And we had a couple people who, because of family coverage and not being real high wage shops to begin with, uh, they were paying fully 45 to 50% of their wages every year towards their health care. I mean, they were working for their health care. That was basically it. So it's stunning once you start walking through this with people. Exactly. And that's the whole benefit of using this healthcare cost calculator. Any other questions, comments? If not, I guess we could wrap this up. Uh, I thank you all for uh, taking part in this workshop. I hope you found it beneficial. Uh, I, like I said, I left the link in the, in the chat for more information as well as my email address for you to reach out to me if you have any questions or uh, would like any of these documents that I shared. Hey, John. Yes, George. So just one last comment. We've got to have these conversations with our, at, in these workplaces with our members, with our, even if you're in a non-union workplace, those of us who know about this stuff need to be having these conversations in the lunch rooms, in the break rooms, uh, whenever, you know, at all times, because we've got to educate people and somebody's going to spike pipe up and say, well, my taxes are going to go up and we got to educate. That's an opportunity to really get that conversation going too, to, you know, to blow that myth out of the water. Uh, so just, uh, you know, let's, let's be talking because that's the only way it's going to happen is us talking to our coworkers. Thanks, John. Yep. All right. I thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank okay. you. This was great. See Bye -bye. you tomorrow. Bye-bye.